Hi everyone, sorry for the slight delay there, but um, welcome to this session on the future of the concert hall. Uh, a question that has uh, already come up a few times actually in the course of the of the symposium thus far. So uh, we've got three great, uh, well, three groups of or three presentations um, from four people who have different perspectives on this issue this afternoon. Um, and because we're a little bit late starting, I'll get straight into it. So uh, our first presenter uh, is Tal Walker, and Tal is an Israeli-Belgian concert pianist specialising in Chopin, Mozart, Beethoven, Schumann, and French repertoire. Um, as well as an active performance career and various residencies at uh, Villa Lena in Tuscany, Banff Centre of Arts and Creativity in Alberta, Canada, Tal um, is the founder and the artistic director of Monsieur Croche, uh, a concert series and master classes in Antwerp, Belgium. And I believe that is what we're going to hear about today. So over to you, Tal. And if other speakers can just uh, turn off their videos. And Hello, everyone. And thank you, Neil, for the kind introduction. Let me just share my screen. Okay, I hope you can see it. Um, so I'm very happy to be here and to share with you my project, Monsieur Croche. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Tal Walker and I would like to present a concert series which I founded and I'm directing since 2018. So let's begin. First of all, the name. Monsieur Croche is actually the pen name or nom de plume of the composer Claude Debussy when he wrote music critique for the magazine La Revue Blanche in 2000, um, La Revue Blanche. In 2018, we marked 100 years for Debussy's passing, and so we focus on French music from the 19th and 20th century. Connection with audience through emotionally uh, immersing and intellectually intriguing experiences is our vision for the future of classical music. We bring French music to a broad public approachable, engaging, and unique way. So what is so unique about us? Let's take a look at some of our venues in Antwerp, Belgium. In the background, you might hear a live performance of Debussy's Prelude à l'après-midi d'Anfon played in four hands by Liane Rodriguez and myself from one of our past concerts. Our performances take place in unconventional venues, such as art galleries, museums, and cathedrals. The small venue and the proximity to the artists make the event intimate and exclusive at eye level with our audience. This also makes our events interdisciplinary before making them interdisciplinary. The venue itself is rich with art and architecture and provides a creative environment. Each concert is one of a kind as it tells the story of one specific composer. You can see here on the screen some of the composers we already paid tribute to. We have Forer, Ravel, Saint-Saëns and Debussy. We have a lovely narrator, Semper Linden, and together we research the stories behind the composers and behind the pieces and present these in a playful way in three languages, Dutch, French, English. We include poetry, literature, letters, and biographical information. Sometimes we intertwine these uh, texts together with the music itself. Here you can see some of our past uh, concerts. So far, we have managed to include musicians from diverse ages, genders, and cultures. We invite celebrated, celebrated performers, such as Eliana Rodriguez, Delphine Bardin, and one of our future artists is Ralf van Raat for the upcoming concert to perform on the same stage with emerging artists. Diversity and inclusivity are key factors in our programming, but it never comes at the expense of the quality. 
Our musicians are specialists in their repertoire. Here is a small example of a collaboration which took place just before the outbreak of the pandemic. In February 2020, we held a concert in the beautiful Museum de Rede, which exhibits art by Munch, Felicia Rob, and Goya. As you see in these pictures, the concert began in a standard theater setting. At the, at the break, we invited our audience to go downstairs and have a glass of wine while we transform the hall into a catwalk. Here is a short impression from the second half of the evening. <laughs> The concert was a collaboration with sustainable fashion designer Dana Cohen, who creates the textile herself from a recycled fabric. The concert focused on the music of Francis Poulain and Paris of these years. Paris was a symbol of art, music, literature, cinema, and fashion. And in this period, in this period, with an effort, international writers and artists were attracted to Paris and exhibits their art. Among the notable women in Paris of the time was Coco Chanel, whose designs was the symbol of the emancipated woman. As you might have noticed, our models are actually dancers from the Royal Conservatoire of Antwerp. A small twist which made the connection with the music even greater. Social impact is important for us. We ask select artists to give masterclasses to young pianists. These young students, or young in their spirit, are given the opportunity to play in front of audience and learn with renowned artists. The artists are professors of some of the leading music schools in Europe, such as Antwerp, Paris, Genève, Valencia, and Brussels, and music academies, or the Ecole Normale de Paris. The special thing about it is that the students don't pay. I know from my own experience how expensive international masterclasses could be, so we have decided that ticket sales, donations, contributions from the hosting schools, and other means will cover the costs students could participate without breaking their, or better say, their parents' pockets. Last but not least is Monsieur Croche's little nephew, Mini Croche. This is an initiative which started in 2019 of narrated concerts for children. Francis Poulain composed music to the story of Babar, the little elephant. During our first concert, which you can see here, Semper Linden, told the story of Babar in an interactive way with dancing and acting, and I accompanied him on the piano. Sam also created his own text to the story, uh, his own story to the music of the BC's Children Corner performed by Misael Mea Rondo. This was a fun concert for children, but also for the adults accompanying them. I would like to also mention that besides uh, Sam and myself, Mise Kroche is a growing family of uh, amazing volunteers. They came up with some of the initiatives such as Mini Kroche, another initiative that took place in the first and second lockdowns of COVID-19 was the digital concert named Mise Kroche Blijft Taus or Mise Kroche Stays Home in Dutch. And it was based on our past performances with poetry, visual art and narration Instead of spreading it on social media, we decided to offer it to retirement homes and hospitals. We had a few wonderful partners. One of them is the Zickenhaus Network from Antwerpen. And they told us that the patients enjoy the concert in their own comfort. So this was in a nutshell about our vision of the future of classical music, bringing it to the audience in an approachable, engaging, interdisciplinary, unique way. It is our strong belief that awareness, inclusion, and interaction are key elements in keeping classical music alive and relevant today. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions in the discussions. A huge thanks, Tal, for that very uh, 
yeah, very well paced and, and just uh, gave us really good insight into what you've been up to and very interesting uh, sort of concert series without a concert hall, which maybe we'll come to back to in the discussion. Okay. Thank so, you very much. Yeah, I uh, look forward to um, talking later. So uh, next up we have uh, Josh Spear. Uh, Josh, if you want to um, try sharing, yeah, as you are sharing your screen. But uh, Josh is a composer performer from the UK and a member of the, the very active composer performer collective Bastard Assignments, which makes uh, experimental music that explores performativity, movement and live art. Uh, Josh creates music in a variety of genres with an emphasis on what the live experience is like for the audience. And he works with video, experimental theatre, lip sync, uh, virtual reality, movement and integrations of these. He's currently Artistic Research Fellow at the Norwegian Academy of Music. So welcome, Josh. Oh, thank you very much. A very generous introduction. And thanks, Tal. Does everybody hear me? Beautifully. Great. Okay, so my name is Josh Spear. I'm a composer performer, and today I'll be talking about my work with the composer performer group Bastard Assignments in 2020. I'll uh, also mention a more recent project supported by Hello Al Dresden and reference a conversation I had with Moritz Lobeck from Hello Al last month. Moritz is program director of uh, music and media there. So we, Bastard Assignments, create experimental music and perform work in the expanded field of music. Um, nowadays, many composers are working beyond the traditional boundaries of music, expanding into other media and practices. What distinguishes these practices from other interdisciplinary projects is that these artists are realizing the visual or performative elements of their projects themselves. This means we combine our training in music with video, with theatrical concerns, with movement, for example, which shifts the focus from being primarily on sound and instruments to our bodies in space. This is the discipline, the risk of finding, learning, and developing new compositional and performative tools. This is a quote from Jennifer Walsh's manifesto in 2016. I take this statement as a call to action a future created through language whose message has persisted for me. I understand it not as, not as a description of what was going on in 2016, but rather a future Walsh is calling into being. I'll describe two aspects that contribute to my practice that have been touched by the experience of creating collaboratively online during the lockdown era. They are post-production, including editing, coloring, compressing video and mastering audio, and composition extending into post-production and my performance persona through the camera. Uh, there's an Auslander quote. Um, he describes the, the persona as something that persists across performances and social media. It's like an identity in part created by audience also and is performed by the musicians. Firstly, I would describe my practice my, sorry, my approach to working with the group Bastard Assignments. Josh, just uh, so I'm very sorry to interrupt. Um, could you reshare your screen and just make sure you selected the left hand option when you shared to begin with? Mm -hmm. As in share screen, not camera. How is this? people of the session is that better because i have a different view actually to you please tell me in the chat the chat is that there's also a slight delay between uh, front stage and backstage perhaps just continue josh and then okay well that must be some other problem but please continue sorry josh for the interruption Firstly, I've described my approach to working with the group Bastard Assignments as post-instrumental. I borrowed this from an artistic research project by Hockenstein, This Is Not A Drum, which although is about a percussionist practice, is transferable. We each are instrumentalists. Our bodies have bent to our instruments through repetition. 
With them, we have learnt to keep time, to read scores, to count, to play in tune, to pay attention and to listen. Through experimenting with movement, improvisation, use of objects, we are used to approaching performance without any instruments in our hands. Jen Torrance, percussionist, contributes to this idea. This post, this post mustn't be understood as an end point. It is simply an experience of after that arises when one has been made aware of something that was once taken for granted and taken as given. This experience of after is what happens when we remember that we have bodies that they are imprinted with the instruments that we have individually bent ourselves towards for years and collectively over centuries. She also says she rejects any mythology around the end of instrument and instrumental thinking. I now have a choice to compose four instruments or not to use objects as instruments and use instruments as objects. It is this awareness through rethinking my relation to my instrument that makes it post-instrumental. To sum up what makes us composer performers, I use it to mean that we create work knowing that we will be in it. For me, this means that I create dispositions and tendencies as well as those of the group. In a practical sense, it also means that whilst I'm composing something, I tend to be rehearsing and workshopping ideas within the same space and period of time. And I'm trying to il illustrate this with a diagram. Here I am sat at my desk, creating, I can demo it in the space, usually not always. Rehearsals are usually in preparation for performance, but here they are part of the creation phase. Rehearsals make clear in three-dimensional space compositional intentions, and also sharp potential problems for the performance of a work that can quickly be solved. Because of this, I say that this practice is on a continuum, performance and preparation for the performance of a work feedback into the composition of that work. Between March and June of 2020, we met many times as a group to try ideas we had for this new arena, of which I will only talk about my own. Quickly, we realized that Zoom and similar video conferencing platforms were not actually putting us in the same space so that we could play together, but they were actually instruments in themselves that forced us to bend to them, to what they could do. I approach this working period with interest and a desire to simply do something with my friends and colleagues. I started with the idea of working visually and exploring counterpoint. I explored using video scores, meaning each of us had a video to imitate in real time. We had to start in sync, which is hard to do online, so I thought to use time and date to synchronize a start time. Here's a screenshot uh, Caitlin made of her screen there's us uh, live along the bottom in Zoom. There's the time on the top left and the video to imitate. On the... We filmed entire rehearsals habitually, improving on an idea brought by one of us and were satisfied with the version we had arrived at. We would share the excerpt online. Here is a small excerpt of an etude of mine. You can see that our task was to imitate imaginatively the video in the center. In this exercise, the idea was to use the group's creativity through interpretation of what they were seeing. Often the images were impossible to physically imitate. So the diagram I showed before has morphed. No longer were the different periods separated by space. It all happened in the same space. The, se the sessions were generative in that they generated ideas for the future. 
Each session blurred the distinction between creative and rehearsal periods, whilst already always being performances. Of course, the rest of our lives also took place in this space as well. We learned a lot about the platform Zoom, this new instrument, such that we were able to create a body of and an information sheet for the 11 artists, composers, choreographers and groups who we commissioned in June of last year to devise new works for the medium with us as performers. We as a group are not super interested in continuing to work solely online. Caitlin and I are quite interested in what else the medium can produce, but along with Tim and Ed, we are desperate to return to in-person rehearsals and performances. But this time, this pause will not be forgotten. Mulhu Hellerau said that he hopes the digital stuff will continue and that the digital will become an instrument for artists in the future. He said that if you just have one colour, then you paint with just that colour. Indeed, for us, we now might approach future collaborations with an artist on Zoom initially to explore early ideas and material. He understands this time as a pause, a pause he defined as a stop and reflection that could be different to simply do. I asked Moritz, did he think that the many online projects like ours threatened the future of live events in theatres, festivals and concert halls? And his answer was simple, no. He described last year not as the year of the mask, but as the year of lowering the mask that exposed problems that were already there. He gave an example. He said he was surprised at the lack of financial solidarity between theatres who received funding and those who relied on ticket sales alone. And this could be perhaps where things would come undone in the future. Composer Gnau is a four-part web series that was commissioned by Hellerhau and Lindenfels Leipzig earlier this year. Composer John Moran and I play the co-hosts who, though in different cities, meet on YouTube and present contemporaneous narrative across the course of an episode. After the first episode, I add more facets to my characterization of myself. In doing so, I'm adding detail to my persona to use Auslander's definition of it. This new consideration came as a result of moving the stage into the home, a domestic and every entirely real. I was also presenting myself as the real version of me through my persona and through the narrative I was creating in my scene. Because I was now presenting an ostensibly mundane situation through the focused lens of a camera, I had to rethink my performance. Auslander writes that uh, to perform is to represent oneself. Music performance is to represent oneself within a discursive domain of music. Auslander also writes that an audience experiences the music as mediated through the persona of the performer. So actually, this concern finds itself at the core of musical performance. Without a live performance that we would all have to travel to, we, Bastard Assignments, had more time and energy to devote to, to post-production, learning skills to refining the quality of the video we would be presenting in lieu of a real show. And for me, this period of creating for, for video has brought attention to the persona that I bring that persists across performances and that I can affect it going forward. Thank you very much. I wonder how many people presentation. Thank you, Josh. Um, there is a request to share the presentation in the chat, in the chat so uh, at least then people will see your, your diagram. But I, I still, uh, I, well, I could see small slides and I still wasn't able to follow it very well. So thank you. Um, look forward to discussing some of the, yeah, the uh, legacy uh, implications of of, uh, of this time. But our final presentation, we have uh, two vital figures in, involved in the day to day running of a uh, current concert hall, Angela Dixon and Sir Barry I. Uh, Angela Dixon is chief executive of Saffron Hall, a seven hundred and forty seat concert hall within the Saffron Walden uh, County High School, a little south of Cambridge, UK. She was formerly classical music programmer at the Barbican and, indeed, uh, and became chief exec of Saffron in uh, 2014. And in 2016, won the ABO Rangold uh, Concert Hall Manager of the Year. Uh, Sir Barry Ife 
was principal of the Guildhall School in London from 2004 to 2017 and is now an honorary research fellow there. Uh, before this, he was a professional academic uh, specializing in the cultural history of Spain and Spanish America. Uh, Barry was appointed CVE in the 2000 Berkeley Honours for Services to Hispanic Studies and in 2017 was awarded knighthood for services to performing arts education. But he uh, talks to us today in his role as the chair of Saffron Hall. So uh, over to Angela and Barry. Okay, thank you very much, Neil. Uh, I hope everybody could see the uh, see the presentation. I'm going to crack on anyway. Well, good afternoon, everyone. In no more than 10 minutes, Andrew and I hope to tell you something about Saffron Hall, how we've coped with the current challenges, what we've learned, and what the future might bring. So, Angela, you've been running Saffron Hall since it opened in 2013. What, for you, are its main distinctive features? Well, three things really, uh, location, specification, and integration. Um, so here you can see um, Cambridge's, uh, uh, Saffron Warden's relationship to Cambridge and also to London. Uh, Saffron Hall is located in Saffron Warden, which is a small market town about 20 kilometers south of east of Cambridge. So it's not in a large city. It's also located in an outstanding comprehensive school with 2,200 children aged 11 to 18. It's a unique partnership between a private trust and a state school. And it was funded by a grateful parent and cost just 10 million pounds to build. And yet it offers so much. First, flexibility. In the standard configuration, it has 740 seats, but we can put it into theater mode with a large orchestra pit, as you can see there. Or we can cover over the pit and make it completely flat floor, as you can see there. Or we can even bring in tables for a dinner and concert event, which are there. And what you can't see is our most prized feature, which is our truly outstanding and flexible acoustic. This means we can offer a world-class programme of classical music, jazz, world and folk, Britain Symphonia and the LPR resident orchestras, but we also work closely with local opera groups, choral societies and orchestras. A distinctive feature of our programme is having both amateur and professional musicians on stage. As you'd expect, we have an extensive programme of school and community projects that are fully integrated with our professional programme. This slide shows the LPO, the London Philharmonic Orchestra, leading a composition workshop with students from local schools. We also partner with a conservatoire and running a Saturday, mu Saturday music school and with a local university, a music therapy project for people living with dementia and their carers. And there is a project of our, a picture of our dementia project uh, there. So the school owns the hall. They have it during the week and we have it at weekends and in the school holidays. We don't have to program more concerts than our audience base can support. The school maintains the building, but we contribute to the overheads and pay for the high spec equipment. We don't cost the school anything, but we contribute massively to the cultural well-being of students at Saffron and the other 50 schools we work with in the region. One other distinctive feature of Saffron Hall is that we don't receive any public subsidy. So when COVID-19 struck last March and we had to close the hall, our main concern was to make sure that we didn't lose our main revenue stream, our audience. So our key message was, bear with us, we'll be back before too long. We only cancelled what we couldn't postpone or reschedule, and so far most of our members have stayed loyal. When we were allowed to open again, we reconfigured the hall cabaret style so that we could put on concerts under socially distanced conditions. This gave us 150 tickets to sell and the potential to seat 300 without social distancing. And at the same time, we experimented with new formats, start times, one hour concerts, no interval, drinks delivered to your table, and up to four different concerts in one day so that audiences could pick and mix. And between August and December, we managed to put on 43 concerts sold 3,385 tickets and provided employment for 326 musicians. We also moved all of our community and education offer online 
and dipped our toes into streaming. This is expensive to do well, hard to monetize, and it does risk cannibalizing our main revenue base, but the potential to reach worldwide audiences online is huge. Angela, these experiments all prove popular, but how many of them will become part of the new normal, do you think? Well, we're pretty confident that existing audiences will return to concert halls, and there's a strong swing towards localism, which bodes well for facilities outside major cities such as Saffron Hall. We also think there'll never be a better time to pick up new audiences because a lifetime of habits has been broken and there may be a desire to try something new. Absolutely every member of the artistic community has taken giant steps forward in the area of digital delivery over the past year. But we'll have to wait for live to return to work out which bits of the digital universe are actually useful. At Saffron Hall, we'll continue to look for online elements in our schools and community projects, as uh, shown here, significantly extending the reach of that work. We will stream occasional concerts, but mostly under the banner of access. We intend to return to our previously well-attended quality programme of live events. But amongst those concerts, we'll be introducing Saffron Hall Festival weekends. On five weekends a year, we'll take the hall back to the cabaret format. We'll pack the schedule with an almost continuous flow of events ranging from professional to amateur and international to local. Events will vary in length, start at different times of the day and tables can be booked for one or multiple events. There'll be significant emphasis on food and drink, which will be locally sourced or have cultural links to the content. Some days may even feel more like a cafe with music than a concert hall. Our capacity will be significantly reduced by the table format, but on the other hand, reduced capacity offers an opportunity for more experimental or less well-established artists. We're not so much losing capacity as gaining a small hall. We hope these weekends will encourage greater participation from our community, further blurring the lines between our professional programme and our schools and community work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Uh, in fact, very uh, condensed, but managed and managed to get a great deal in a very short space of time. And what a what a unique uh, space it is in so many ways. And not in, well, I mean, the public subsidy thing is is quite amazing in many ways, and also a uh, a non urban situation is is also very uh, unusual. So, if I could invite all the the other speakers to uh, turn their cameras on um, so they can join in the discussion and uh, if I can sort of summarize them uh, in terms of our, our theme we've got a, a concert series without a concert hall uh, mm -hmm. a, a group a sort of grassroots experimental group who were experimenting outside of the concert hall in this case in a digital space and then a concert hall that's trying to deal with the, the new situations but in many ways uh, as we've just seen this is quite unique um, in, in its position to, to deal with those. If I could uh, kick off to, to maybe try and connect what are the two most uh, disparate parts of the session. Um, Josh, what, what would you, what would Bastard Assignments, um, and I'd actually be interested to hear where that name comes from uh, briefly also, um, we maybe get asked that a lot. Uh, what, what would Bastard Assignments look for from a space, from a, a live space? Um, because it's people are thinking a lot about multifunctional spaces at the moment and you are kind of uh, a grassroots uh, group who do uh, who are pushing a lot of boundaries so what what would you look for from a space um i think bastard science the name didn't originate from the group um there should be a more interesting story but i think someone gave it to us it's probably something to do with uh university uh it's a slightly interesting question because we actually began as an event series that was the name was the name of an, an event series and then um, we became a group we used to hire our own venues we'd go out and find um interesting places like in a similar way to tal but we would pick venues that uh had real character or 
were sort of falling over a little bit or a little bit edgy. Um, I think secretly this was to make us look a little bit more tidy. Actually. <laughs> um, so it, yeah, we sort of looked for versatile spaces that we could bring our own rig in and basically do whatever. Um, however, um, we had this wonderful residency at Snake Maltings and it sort of galvanized us as a group and we thought we want to actually um, be booked by festivals and this kind of stuff and up our game a little bit. Um, so actually we started making stuff that was uh, flexible, that was that would work on theatrical stages, more conventional stages, festival stages. So, um, so yeah, it's been a bit of a shift. Not really a clear answer for you, but... No, no, that's, that's interesting. There's, 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 there can be... Uh, sorry, I have to mute if you're not speaking. Apologies. Um, there can be a bit of a, a tension, can't there, between um, or well, there are certain things that specific spaces give you, and, and Tal, that's something I think your your concert series is really playing on. But are there um, are there particular challenges in going to spaces that are not used to uh, catering for for classical performance? That was directed to me, right? Yes. Yes, uh, of course. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, there is um, a certain capacity of audience that we can have, which means in one hand that it's very intimate and it's very nice that um, we have a small amount of audience. Uh, financially, it could cause a, a bit of a challenge because we cannot sell, we can sell only that amount of tickets. Uh, secondly, of course, we need to completely reshift so we cannot have an art gallery that uh, is showing a sculpture at the moment so it has to be empty to put the chairs there we need to rent a piano so all this logistic behind it make it more challenging but but more rewarding when it's actually um, working out and, and it looks fantastic question for you also in the chat tal um how did you initially refer to um uh, Mr. Grosh, as uh, in terms of marketing, uh, I suppose it's people who are used to a concert series in a particular place, uh, and you are dispersed. Yes, so um, that's very interesting. I mean, we the whole concept is a bit experimental, so we try to experiment in very various um, uh, channels of promotion. We went through. Uh, uh, first of all, the network of the venues itself, and that brought us different audience than of concert halls because it's either uh, art uh, lovers or art collectors that uh, would would come to to listen to classical music. Secondly, we we did collaborate with some institutions of music, uh, some concert halls who would publish our flyers or posters. Uh, or the conservatory in Antwerp that was uh, promoting it in the website as a, a project of one of the alumnus. So we had a lot of very warm uh, support from the locals uh, that would help us spread the word. Uh, and secondly, social media, a lot of videos, Facebook, Instagram, um, to try to get to young audience. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question for everyone, but I'll maybe direct it to, uh, to Barry and, and Angela, um, as well as adding my own question. I'd be, I'd be very interested if you could just sort of explain a little bit more about the relationship between the school and, and the concert hall and how, because in some ways, uh, for, for the, the uh, modern orchestra, that sort of sounds ideal, although perhaps there are also challenges. Uh, and also to ask uh, Madeleine Landinger's uh, question, which of your existing formats do you think will survive in the next 20 years? Or perhaps easier to say, what, what formats are you, are you looking at? And I think you alluded to that in your presentation, but uh, to say a little bit more about the formats you're looking to explore uh, going forward. Um, yeah, so uh, if I answer about the relationship with the school, so the Saffron Hall is actually the school hall. Um, there isn't another one, and they do their public exams in there and their school productions and their school music concerts and their parents' evenings. Um, and they also come and listen to uh, the London Philharmonic Orchestra in there as well. Um, so it's an incredible space and it encompasses all of those things. Uh, that obviously has challenges because we have to very carefully manage the diary. Um, and every time public exams change, I, I my heart skips a beat. 
um, to uh, work out what that means for my concert series. But um, in, a, in a rural place like Saffron Warden, it's, it's not a big place and I don't need to put on a, on a performance every evening, as we've said. And in fact, the limiting of the programme it, it, it is not a bad thing at all. Um, it, it keeps me under control, stops me over programming. Um, and it, it's just about the right amount of content for the number of people living in the area. So that the, the, the symbiosis works very well. Most schools, schools will tell you that their school hall stands empty for a huge period of time throughout uh, the school term and the school holidays. Uh, so this is a very um, good symbiotic relationship in terms of diary. Um, in terms of which formats will survive, I do feel there's there's a there's a sort of a, a chasm opening up between classical audiences, and on the one hand there is an audience that is very fixed on what it likes and what it knows in terms of repertoire concert format, and then I think there's another audience who um, are very interested in not just contemporary music but new ways of presenting concerts, and I I, I see that split opening up, and I think we are very lucky in Saffron Hall in a way that we can cater to both at the moment. Which will come out ahead, I don't know. Um, somehow the traditional audience seems to keep replenishing itself. And um, uh, I don't know if I can put it in this indelicate way. Some fall off the end of the conveyor belt. Some seem to join, um, which, which, which is good. But there is this kind of breakaway now, I think, for more contemporary styles for, for the kind, well, both, both what we see here, the way that Tal presents music and the way that Josh does as well. And that's very exciting as well. We're very lucky to be able to do both. And so we will continue to do so as long as there's an audience for both. All right, yes, please, if you can unmute yourself. Barry, we need, we need, you need to unmute yourself, sorry. Right, there's the third way. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the tricky issue of, of, of streaming, uh, which, are, as I said, is actually, I think, really quite expensive. To do well, um, and we, you know, we see it done badly quite a lot. Um, and uh, the halls that so far have managed to do it well. I mean, if you take the Wigmore, for example, is is very successful, but it is it is publicly funded. It does have the funds to to do that, and it has generated a quite a quite a large income stream for itself through donations, uh, which is which is again a really interesting development you know and obviously as chairman of the trust you know i have to have more than half an eye on you know where the money is going to come from to pay uh, for all of this but i do think streaming is uh, an interesting technological and artistic and sociological uh, development um and um one that you know i i hope very much that we will be able to take forward albeit in a you know, perhaps in a limited way, and as Angela says, playing to our strengths and inclusion, um, education. And we have, we didn't really say very much about our education, but uh, one of the benefits of being located in a hall, uh, in in a, in a school which is a very very good school anyway, has very strong music. Uh, as, uh, and, you know, has the Saturday school run by by Guildhall um, and a very strong outreach and uh, working with um, local university on dementia and so on, um, playing to those strengths and using streaming and, and, and uh, online uh, delivery uh, that way. But I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to think that one way or another, you know, we can participate and contribute to uh, the development of online delivery of, of, of classical music. Um, but I, I, as I say, I do think it's very, it, it's, it's very tricky. And um, what, what really strikes me quite often with, you know, watching Guild, uh, watching Wigmore uh, online concerts is how, how tricky the, the performers find it as well, particularly playing to an empty hall. I think, uh, you know, uh, broadcasting online concerts that are live where there's an audience yes it's i think not... i think as well um i don't know but personally speaking as an audience member i'm starting to find online concerts quite quite tricky as well now yeah. we're slowly, slowly running out of time a little bit there right. is one more question for the, the saffron hall um uh contingent so perhaps in the chat you could just have a, a respond to that perhaps as i go just towards the end to 
ask last question to Josh and Tal, which is um, which is a big question at the moment. Which is and uh, Josh, you, you mentioned it a little bit, but yeah, what the legacy of this time will be. But I was just talked about, or I was just sort of wondering about the the long term impact of of streaming, uh, but. I'd, uh, and but we've heard that many people are really looking forward to getting back into a console or some kind of uh, live situation. So perhaps uh, briefly, Josh first, and then Tom. I mean, I've got no idea really, uh, but I think I think performance is going to be something that we we do and want to see um, until the end of time, and hope. Um, and as I um, said, we've kind of got better at uh, being our own kind of film studio um, and things like streaming will get better and better. Um, I think that's, that's all I can say, really. And Tal? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very big question. Um, I'm very humble to try to answer it, but I could say of my own experience, my own personal experience, uh, after being isolated uh, for months in the first lockdown, I remember that when I first heard other instruments when I moved to London and, and the, at the Royal College, and I, I really had tears in my eyes again to see chamber music and people performing face-to-face, -face, even though I've seen wonderful streaming and digital concerts. So I hope that this will just give us some more hunger for live events and to come to concerts and see it face to face and in, uh, in a project like ours in within a few uh, meters from the from the artists. So I, I hope the legacy yeah, is just coming back to life, bringing music back to life. Thank you very much, and thank you to all our uh, our panelists here. A very interesting session. I think um, the concert hall. We were always looking for for it to provide answers to a lot of questions. Some of which it, it can, and perhaps some of which it it, it will not. And and uh, it will perhaps for a long time be an institution that some people need to uh, rail against and step outside of. Well, whereas some people will will be exploring things within it. So. Um, I'll just leave you with that thought and uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the symposium. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye. Yes. Okay.